I'm um, a reader in creative learning and teaching in the School of Education. Um, so my specialism is, um, I suppose, creative inquiry, creative pedagogy. And um, I'm a research fellow um, in the Centre for Cultural and Creative Industries. And in that context, I get, a, I get to set up these uh, experimental sites of pedagogical innovation. Um, I'm going to share one of our projects with you in a moment called The Forest of Imagination and how we integrate um, undergraduates and postgraduates actually into that experience. Um, and then I also work in the School of Art, but mostly in India <laughs> as a pedagogue. Um, we're working with a project that was initially funded through HRC on um, setting up a living a living classroom, working with um, children who live in informal settlements. And then the rest of the week, uh, well, I try and find time each week to remain an artist, um, but I am director of research for a charity that's now called House of Imagination. We used to be called Five by Five because we set up several years ago with five artists working with five schools and five cultural centres. But now, 20, 21 years on, we renamed ourselves um, in memory of Sir Ken Robinson, who was our patron for 20 years. So we work with him very closely around creativity and uh, creative and cultural education. So, um, yes, I mean, really, I just should have said I'm an artist. Uh, my PhD was uh, in visual inquiry, working alongside children and people. And um, I'll send you my books uh, coming out in the summer. It's called Children Are Artists. But yes, yeah, so um, Jenny asked me to give a, a kind of creative provocation. I mean, I seem to have the graveyard slot in that you're probably all starving and want lunch. So, Happy biscuits. Yes, that's okay. So what, what I thought I would do was to keep it really playful and all of the values that we've just shared with Caroline's session as well will inform this session. So um, what, I've, what I've designed is just a very playful um, 20... Um, 20 images uh, around the Petra Kucha model but I've broken the rule because I've added a couple of very very short films in um, so I, I thought if I spoke for about 15-20 um, minutes at the most and then we'll open it out for dialogue and discussion and then you, you can obviously take that into your lunch hour as well uh, as you choose so yeah it is I must be honest it is quite challenging just being online <laughs> Because I'm very envious not to be in the room. Uh, so, um, yes, and I'm sorry because I've been flying around on my magic Zoom carpet to various countries. So, as Ian knows, I just got back from Finland. So, um, I'm going to share my screen. Is the sound okay? Too far. Good. Okay, let me share my screen. Now, as I said, I work on a Mac and it doesn't like me. Uh, the Chrome doesn't like me, but let's hope it works. So uh, let's let this out. If you can see my desktop, just have a laugh. I um, I I I like showing my multitasking. <laughs> I think it's Iris. Is it Van Twin in Utrecht University? Um, who talks about um, showing your messy working, and I think that's really important. That we all do, especially alongside our students. Perfectly. Is that okay? Actually, yeah, perfect. Now, because I'm on uh, Google Slides, it means I can't see you, so forgive me. Um, but please interrupt, and it means I also can't see the chat. So do interrupt me if you'd like to. I'm completely fine with that. Um, so yes, as I said, I have a, um, a kind of two roles. Well, three roles in the university but as a as a pedagogue if you like then um, that's my specialism to really to try and live out my values as we've just talked about as an artist and that's why although I was a bit thrown by those inspiration cards because I, I was across about three at once but yeah to ha to find that space to be a, a creative activist but also to work alongside students in co-inquiry so the phrase creative ecosystem has really um, 
it really does mirror my work that we're inviting these creative communities of practice. Um, what I hope to do is kind of unfold or, yes, just to uh, shine a lens, maybe that's a better metaphor, on some of the key principles of creative pedagogy. And that, that's what I've been really paying attention to attention to since I've been at the university, I think since 2007. So um, I'm looking particularly at how the role of students can be integrated into these creative ecosystems. So the project I want to share with you is in its ninth year and it's called the Forest of Imagination. You might have heard of it. Um, Andrew Grant, who designed Gardens by the Bay on the top left, is the co-director as well. So together we work alongside, well now, in its ninth year, probably about 55 creative and cultural partners in the city. And each year we employ um, between uh, 15 and 100 artists and creative cultural professionals alongside. So we work closely with um, every school in the university, but also across the city and the community with local schools as well. So although the project is really uh, about children and young people's engagement, it's now become um, genuinely intergenerational. So together we co-design um, immersive installations across the cities. So we reimagine different spaces and invite our students. So here we've got our design students on the bottom left. This was actually taken nine years ago and those four students still work with us. So I now am able to employ them each year as mentors to the current design students. And then on the bottom right, my education students dressed up as imagination generators, um, working alongside local schools and you know here they're on their final placement for their PGCE. So going back to what Caroline said about kind of the values underpin why we do what we do. So for me creativity and imagination, compassion, integrity, freedom, all of the ones I chose, curiosity. Thinking about our, our role as pedagogues, as um, co-inquirers if you like in the students learning experiences so all of my work is invitational and negotiated rather than prescriptive. So one of the other things I'm trying to do is challenge, especially the English education system, which is very marketized, very prescriptive, very um, based on a performance led agenda. So sorry, I should have said, if you haven't visited Cyan Hill, this was not, not Gardens by the Bay in Singapore. This is um, our other campus, Cyan Hill, which is up on the north side of the city um, where we reimagined each of the different spaces. And we try and put the emphasis on uh, the importance of nature, creativity, imagination in all of our lives. So all of our materials are sustainable and recycled, reclaimed. And also we're trying to respond with imaginative solutions to the ecological emergency. So the sustainable development goals are also embedded in all of our work. Um, so in, in the second year, we took over um, Queen Square in Bath. You may have visited that. Um, in fact, a, a bamboo structure, I haven't got an image of it, but a bamboo structure that we designed is now a, sea, a seawater greenhouse in Somaliland. And here in 2016, we took over the spaces inside and outside the Abbey. So they were partners in the project. The um, middle image is a piece, ironically, you know, the year of Brexit called I Migration, um, designed by Professor Anthony Head, who's now at Dundee University. But there are a thousand butterflies, each butterfly is different. And, you know, the, the kind of key messages around everybody's on the move and everybody's welcome. I mean, very pertinent at the moment with. Ukraine and Afghanistan. We have uh, we work alongside the refugee communities. Sorry, a bit of static on my computer. So, um, so here, each year we have a different theme, um, and again, that theme is negotiated with our team and with our um, student 
cohort as well. So this particular year, we focused on saving the baobabs and the lemurs in Madagascar. So here on the right, um, the children are involved in an immersive den where they're finding the lemur and how to look after it. Um, on the left-hand side, the baobabs that Andrew Grant designed made out of recycled plastic. Um, Andrew Grant and Peter Clegg, who is director, founding director of Fields and Clegg Bradley Studios in the city, um, they have now got a research centre in Madagascar that is literally saving the baobabs and the lemurs. So the, the kind of serious themes um, that we're approaching in a playful way to invite the community to be involved. So here, Field and Clay Bradley Studios, um, architects are working alongside children in local schools to co-design these um, pop-up houses of imagination. So we worked with these student teams at the University of Bath and their architecture department alongside the architects in Field and Clay Bradley Studios. We took over a gallery in the city called 44 AD and set it up as a pop-up house for imagination where it was a temporary making space for the schools to visit and work with the architects. So integrating alongside our students on placements through their courses. So here the design students worked alongside the architects with the children and then we were able to take over the different spaces to share those projects. And those pop-up houses of imagination are now in local schools as kind of outdoor play areas. And in 2018, oh, sorry, I should have said that was 2017, and that was at the University of Bath um, in a meadow next door, which is called Bushy Norwood. Um, so we were able to design, it was actually based on Darwin's walk, principles of um, points of contemplation for an hour's walk around a meadow, and then it children were then, well families, not just children, everybody was invited to have that experience in nature. So in 2018 we took over a quite a challenging area in Bath which is um, leads from Kingsmead Square down to the river. So um, there's a lot of homeless people and um, it seems to be uh, an area of, you know, genuine so socio-economic deprivation so we wanted to invite the community in to this space to then bring a conversation around the kind of importance of including everyone so purposefully we worked alongside a special school in Bath um, called Three Ways and we co-designed the whole event with our students, staff, the teachers in the school, all of the children and young people so it's 180 um, children and young people who are three to 19, and there's 180 staff actually. It's more or less one-to-one. -one. Um, because we wanted it to be universally accessible and everybody to be welcome, because Forest is always free, we raise money through the Arts Council mainly, but through local trusts and foundations, and obviously the university support um, one day a week of my time to work on this as well. And um, it was, to invite, uh, in this particular case, it was one child who could, she could only blink and she was in a wheelchair. So we we made sure that every single um, activity and installation was open and accessible to her, but then obviously to everyone. So here are design students on the top right have been making um, design machines, drawing machines for local schools and families. In the background, you can just see there's a den made of um, reclaimed wood that was designed and made by Field and Clay Bradley Studios. That's now an outdoor library in a local school. It, at the time, it was a nod to the library closing in the city. So we have these kind of, yeah, we, we pay attention to these serious themes, but in a, as I said, in a, in a beautiful, playful way. One of my colleagues, her two values, uh, Caroline, are for everything to be joyful and effortless. Well, it's certainly joyful. It's very hard work, but really worth it. Um, so maybe we could get to the point where it's effortless. On the top left, um, a local artist has designed a, um, a cardboard maze that um, she set up on the river, Jess Palmer, where 
families and schools were invited to play and draw in that. And again, on the bottom right, Andrew Grant designed this performance space that was accessible to wheelchair users and um, inviting, um, well, our work now with Tanvi and Stuart, uh, We Are The People, and we've got a, a sub-project called We Are The People In The Forest. And then Claire Day, bottom left, invited families to all make a tree. So there was a thousand trees made of um, clay. And I think importantly for me that the students' placements are integrated into the whole programme. So because we're turning our university into a social enterprise, um, a lot of our work is in response to um, key issues in the city around, as I said, the ecological biodiversity emergency um, but also um, for instance in relation to that um, aspects like climate anxiety eco anxiety so on the left hand side Shai Akram who um, is based you may know her she's based at the Royal College of Art and she runs the design the, the thesis platform for design um, she's also a trustee of our charity now. This was before she was. This is probably why I invited her. Um, she used to work at Baspa and run the um, design course, which is now run by Julia Keat. And here she's designed an immersive in installation underneath the Egg Theatre with local schools um, and students, but around the concept of bioluminescence. So the children were invited in to explore these deep scientific concepts, but in a in a really um, creative and immersive way. And on the right hand side, each year the film students have a live project working with um, Ruth Farah, who runs that course. She's also a reader in, um, I think, film and TV. She um, invites her students to have live placements. So here the students have made a 360 film for, for us for imagination. 2020 and this year they've just made a film about eco-anxiety where they've been interviewing students and staff at the university but also in their local community and that again they're third year students and that was for their their live placement so the last full-blown event that we had for forest imagination in person was in 2019 we usually attract about 10,000 visitors over a period of five days so here we took over the space at the Holborn in fact Ian I remember your lovely gala visitors coming to that um, and Field and Claire Bradley Studios designed a, a pop-up pavilion called the House of Imagination why wouldn't you um, and we invited other local and national um, organizations to play with us over the period of five days so here Plymouth College of Art I'm a visiting lecturer there as well um, we had a kind of pop-up intervention where we were consulting the community um, about key issues around climate change. And here at Room 13, um, Shani Ali, who runs the Room 13 in Bristol called Hair Clive, which is a studio specifically for children in a primary school. Um, so obviously we work very closely together and here the children had um, made these banners and being on a march around the local streets to try and save the world. So I think act activism is really important element of our work and we've written an article on creative activism which um, I can share with you which is in the, the journal that Melissa Ben edits called Forum. I'll share that with you afterwards. So again on the right family, family uh, workshops, all ages, all invited, it's free and it's for everyone visiting artists here on the bottom left from Barcelona we've got another project which is parallel to Accelerate called Intercise um, so we're always inviting our colleagues to, to work with us wherever they are and on the bottom right one of the um, lead consultants at the local hospital the Royal United Hospital um, ha was so inspired by the work with Forest that she's now co-designed an eco garden outside the ICU unit so that the patients in recovery can then um, witness green spaces. And as I said, you know, the, the key themes that are emerging out of the forest imagination, you know, it is genuinely a, an invitation to have a conversation about our own imagination, about 
our collective imagination about creativity, how we make creativity visible, but also key themes in the community. So here, Piers Taylor, the architect, worked with Charlie Brentley, Charlie Brentnell and um, designed this beautiful forest beacon outside, you know, one of the most iconic um, museums in the city. I'm, I'm sure if you haven't, uh, you'll go tomorrow, but the, the Holborn Museum. And this, again, is a nod to the homeless in the city. So thinking about the key themes around creative placemaking and community around belonging, um, and especially now, you know, about kind of hopeful futures, inviting that kind of action. And this is Andrew Grant's phrase, you know, imagining our great Pulteney Street with a forest um, running through it. But thinking about forest of imagination as a creative ecosystem itself, that not only that we're now connected to thousands of people every year, um, it's an invitation for um, art and participation. So when the pandemic hit, we had to pivot to digital space, clearly. We were going to be taking over the old Art Deco cinema in Bath, it's called The Forum. Um, but instead, this is a beautiful image designed by a local artist called Perry Harris. And in fact, I, did, I, I didn't meet Perry for the first year of Forest because he offered everything to the project digitally. And now we know each other really well and um, he works alongside children and families as well and his very playful illustrations. So the theme this year was to literally to rewild the city. Uh, Andrew Grant talks about Bath being a, a landscape city, a city of imagination. And because we were in the digital space, we were able to work internationally very easily. So we worked with Andrew Amundsen, who um, is based in Berlin. He works with Olafia Eliasson uh, in his studio, but he also works with vendors. He, uh, I met Andrew in Den Denmark pre-COVID, so three years ago, and I was running a project in Aarhus around imagination. Um, and Andrew came to my workshop and we, we've just been working together ever since. He was able to visit the Holborn in 2019 when we had the event there because he was putting up Olivia's um, show at Tate Modern. And then in the middle, working alongside our um, professor, Alf Coles, who's at the University of Bristol, designing a mirror maze with Phil and Clegg Bradley Studios. So that will come to life this year in reality. And on the right, we have another affiliated project in Zimbabwe called Trees of Hope, where here um, Denise Rowe and Kennedy Chinera made a film for the local school so that they could still witness the, the forest in Zimbabwe um, through the land, listening to the land. And that's led to a, a partnership with the new HRC project with Amanda Bailey at our university. So we're working again, integrating uh, work that we're doing with British Council on connected classrooms, but also working on live projects with our students. So in that case, my education students are then on placement in those schools. So we're lucky that Chris Anderson, who designed TED, um, launched TED in Bath many, many years ago. He used to live here, you know, is in New York, but we worked together with Chris and Tom Karnak on TED Countdown in um, 2020. So 10 2020 was our kind of celebration day where we invited artists across the world to join us in a, um, an imaginative response to climate action. So we worked with Mitch Turnbull, who's an environmental documentary maker, um, who was also a, a fellow in our Bristol and Bath creative R&D work uh, around immersion and AR and VR. So She's got this beautiful project called Earth Songs. I can give you any links afterwards. And then we worked also with Olafia Eliasson's Little Sun project, so the Little Sun Choir, which also happened to have um, a link with our work in Zimbabwe. And then last year in 21, we decided to design a hybrid event. So again, you know, all of our work at the university had been online but we were able to integrate the students' experiences and then bring those that were still in the city in June, we were able to bring them um, to, to meet in some of them at the first time I'd met in person, which was wonderful. So we were able to then curate the forest over five, six days um, 
two different weekends from Beckford's Tower on the north side of Bath and then travelling right down to Locksbrook where you are on the river up to Bath City Farm um, over to actually the American Museum it isn't on that map and Bath Eastern Secret Garden. So the Egg Theatre at the time was empty because of Covid and Kate Cross, the director, said to me, Penny, help. <laughs> what can we do? I've got an empty theatre. And I said, it's easy, put a forest inside it. So uh, we managed to raise um, some money quite quickly from uh, local partners. And we were it was a modest budget, but we were to bring Andrew Amundsen over from Berlin. He had worked um, over the year with our students, um, our design students, to think about how that might be possible. So here's a short film. That's wonderful. You want to pass it on to someone else to share? Um, yeah, I'll pass it on to Maggie. Imagine if we could create a space in Bath. Imagine if the tree um to change its shape and its structure imagine if there was the most incredible sensory uh real and imagined space that drew on all of the senses and also brought in some sensory tech so you were in an immersive environment where you could feel the raindrops and getting people emotionally invested. And almost like if you created an installation at home with your kids or as a family, sponsor, like a section of the tree, a community project. Imagine if a Christmas tree wasn't just for Christmas, but for spring, summer, autumn and winter. Up all year round. Imagine if it was a habitat for local wildlife and insects growing native wildflowers and plants, attracting bees and butterflies. So we, we literally did that. So working with the design students over the, um, the summer term, we were then able to bring a living forest into the Egg Theatre in September. And some of the second, some of the third year students had graduated, but they came back and some of the second year students are now continuing to work with us. So um, we borrowed a forest from local architects and we watered it every day. Um, we looked after all of the um, ecosystems in the forest, including the spiders. And, and this is what we co-designed with Andrew in Berlin, with the students, with um, Charlie Brentnell, Piers Taylor, and also working with um, Roxana Vilk and the Vilk Collective and Squid Soup to co-design these beautiful orbs that were each responsive to sound and light. So um, they they sang the song of the forest, the bird song, the, um, the sound of the canopy, the sound of the roots and the mycelium. Um, and we were able to also bring the installation at the American Museum, you'll see in a minute, we brought the, um, there was 50 metres of talking flowers, talking tubes, where children would um, talk to each other through 50 metre tubes. So we redesigned that as the kind of mycelium network in the in the cafe. So this is the auditorium. So the children entered into the cafe, into the roots of the forest, then were able to um, seek the canopy at the top. I'll show you that in a minute. Just a short film. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
And in the canopy, in the in the top of above the auditorium, the um, studio, the Roka room, in the egg theatre, we turned into an immersive space to invite families in to um, adopt um, a magical creature in the forest. So we had we had won some emergency funding from the Arts Council to work with families most impacted by COVID, and so again in response to our kind of social enterprise mission as a university. Um, I mean, our kind of phrasing around knowledge exchange is very much around human capacity, social value, environmental sustainability. Um, and I think that what I try and do and what we try and do together as a team is to invite this, um, if you like, a living classroom. So the, the living tree was a living classroom. We're inviting serious, playful, seriously playful conversations about, you know, the importance of um nature and how here the children coming to the adoption center they can invent a magical creature in the forest and look after it so i think that the whole notion of um pedagogy for me is to make it visible and to invite the students into that space of co-inquiry where it is about uh possibility thinking valuing uncertainty, valuing failure, trying things out together. So a lot of the mirror, sorry, pun here, um, of the workshop with Caroline. So this year we've been invited back to the egg and we're going to co-design a mirror maze with the students, with the architects at Phil and Claire Bradley Studios and Alf Coles, who's our um, professor of maths at University of Bristol. Um, he's written extensively on maths education and um, teaching maths as though the planet matters and um, obviously ecology and, and climate change are right at the heart of his work. So again, underpinning all of our work with the sustainable development goals. And so um, we'll have the installation in the egg. It won't look like this because we don't know what it's going to look like yet. Um, so we're working with the design students at the moment. We had our first session last week and then we'll invite um, the art students, the education students, all the students across the university to, to get involved. I also run a research group in the Centre for Environmental Humanities called Earth, which is about environment, arts and, and education working together. So we will have a kind of a mirror maze and then over the three weeks that we're there, we will then rewild the mirror maze um, so that people can see themselves reflected in nature and then taking responsibility for, um, you know, taking that kind of hopeful action. And as Margaret Heffernan said, you know, seeing ourselves as stewards of the environment, looking after, um, we, you know, we are nature, we are, we are the forest. So um, just to finish then, so we will take the installation from the egg up to the American Museum where we started again last year. You can see the reused mycelium network here with the listening flowers. And it's a beautiful space. If you do get a chance to visit tomorrow, 
um, it's acres of beautiful meadow and woodland and gardens um, and they've literally given it uh, given us a, as a kind of carte blanche to take over again this summer so thank you for listening uh, my question was going to be what are your key principles of creative pedagogy um, so I think I will hand that over to you because I think I hadn't expected um, the detail in Caroline's workshop but I think a lot of it um, is is you know very very much at the heart of what I do and I was also inspired very strongly by Paolo Freire's work but also Deleuze and Guattari and, and the notion of I think I met Deleuze and Guattari halfway through my PhD and I fell down uh, one of those rabbit holes um, and I don't think I ever got out so let me just unshare Where are, you? Where are you? Am I still here? Oh, you are. Thank you. <laughs> hey. Thank so, you. Uh, Ian, can you can you be my chair, please? Because I can't see people properly. I can just see you, and I can. Yes. The microphone will pick up as other people, uh, um, but um, uh, uh, I'm happy to act as chair. Uh, um, and uh, um, I mean, I, I don't know whether people want to talk about creative pedagogy or whether they want to think about the cool things they could do with immersive tech uh, if they were part of the, the forest of imagination. I mean, some of this, you were using some of the language, you know, imagination, immersion, uh, um, in a way that, that is quite, you know, has echoed through the, the last couple of days. Um, and one thing I would say is that obviously we, um, you sort of hinted at this, you're, you're, you're delivering the Forest of Imagination to the, the residents of Bath, particularly young people and families, but, but it's inclusive. But the, the agents of this are, in some cases, external artists and so on, and, and, and other partners, but there are also undergraduate students who are involved in this. Absolutely, yes. And we have, so um, from the design school, as Andrew knows, but also the art school and uh, the film, well, film is now in the art school, uh, got that sorry and obviously with our education team as well um, we're also working with the new applied humanities course we've got um, projects working with the wildlife conservation degree and the new architecture course um, we designed a new MBA in creative leadership which I'm not sure I've even had a chance to tell you Ian so that's really interesting as well so we've got kind of undergraduate and postgraduate um, Kind of invitation and and i think for me the metaphor is that it is an invitation it's it i i i know that that wonderful phrase from joseph boyce you know every classroom should be a work of art but that's why i wanted to show you the living tree because for me that is a classroom you know it's not at the moment in the art school i'd love to take over the uh, street by the way andrew if you could just get that one in there i'd like a forest in the street put my wish list um, but yes, to, to have every space to be um, beautiful learning. And I think that for me, that's what's wrong with the English education system in schools, especially that, um, you know, learning is everywhere. In fact, that was the title of the article we wrote around creative activism for forum um, that Melissa Ben did the, the forward for. So I think, yeah, I think it's about it's what Caroline was talking about in terms of agency, but it's actually co-agency because we're co-designing everything, co-producing it. Uh, everything is around the co-words for me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any any questions, comments, ideas? From I know blood sugar is low, but Daryl. It's um it's a really specific question. I was just wondered if you could say a little bit more about um turning the university into a such Right. Yeah, so um, I, I've done a lot of work over the last year or more maybe around what what that might look like with the there's various teams. So there's the um, Enterprise Steering Group, which is part of the External Affairs Unit, and then the Creative Leadership Initiative, which is where the Creative Leadership MBAs come from. But all of our values in response to the community, so being um community facing and if you like in service to the community 
So Margaret Heffernan said to me the other day, she said, we're working closely with her on a concept called the city of imagination, um, which was actually framed in response to Sir Ken Robinson's death so that we would have a legacy to live out. And so the social enterprise, enterprise, the social enterprise element, um, she said, well, it's not even a Trojan horse because it's not sneaky. You know, what we're doing is very visibly working with every part of the community, whether you're in an early years centre or a school or a college or the other university or a cultural partner, um, a creative partner, that everybody sees themselves as part of this process. So I think the social enterprise elements around, um, and that's how the link with knowledge exchange comes out so clearly for me, you know, and those framing around those three kind of pillars, human capacity, social value, and environmental sustainability. I think that's what makes up our kind of uh, mission to be a social enterprise. So we are going for the kind of gold mark accreditation for that, which I think is really interesting. And all the live projects, whether that's in Forest of Imagination with the architecture degree or with our, um, so on Friday, I met all the creative media students, Matt, Free, Matt is Matt still there? Uh, Matt students um, who are, um, in fact, if Matt, is Matt still there? Because he could talk about this rather than just me. No, he has to go. So Matt's uh, final year dissertation students are taking on the concept of a city of imagination, uh, we drafted a manifesto with Sue Rigby, our vice chancellor, and Margaret Heffernan working together. And I, I just said to them, literally in December, whenever it was, I just said, can we just give it to the students? So we've literally put it in the hands of the students to co-design. Um, you know, they both love the idea. And now we've got a, an event on Tuesday, actually, which, um, is very much around involving the community um, as a social enterprise in this project. So I'll pop it in the chat in a minute. I'm clearly no good at multitasking. But yes, and I think the evidence of that across each course as well. So we have a new, I don't know whether it's public yet, we have a new uh, Centre of Applied Humanities, which I think is going to be called something like the Centre of the Humankind, which I love. Um, and I think that idea that every, every student whatever course they're taking but especially in the arts of course but whatever course they're taking they can see themselves as active citizens making a difference to the community and and that really came out strongly during covid where well, we still have covid but you know where the textile students were working with the university of bath on ppe equipment you know we gave our empty accommodation to families that were isolating the local hospital etc cetera, etc cetera. and I think for me that's really a, a kind of future facing university where the the values of the well-being economy especially and in terms of a green recovery then that's really where our mission is in response to especially in response to the eco ecological emergency if I could say that word I mean, I'm, I'm interested in this idea because I think one of the criticisms really of the that approach, and we have a similar kind of mission statement that um, is supposed to be sort of underpinning our activity at Camberwell, about, um, you know, having a, a sort of uh, being there for, for social good. But the criticism is often that the, the flow of um, information or the flow of activity is, is projecting out from the university. The university is not a permeable institution. And actually what's been proven so far for us at Campbell is that we lay claim to being this thing, but in actual fact, our doors are pretty much um, metaphorically, if not physically closed to the, the communities. And the other sort of more severe criticism is that it's a form of kind of um, uh, colonization, effectively coming out from the privileged space into the, um, the space of the, the people who are less privileged or oppressed. And I just wondered whether that was, um, I'm sure you're thinking about that, we're all thinking about that and thinking about how to resolve those particular problems. But is there something about, is there something in that kind of conversation that needs to be um, part of how we understand the success of any kind of activity? I think, you know, I mean, we're all familiar with live projects, for instance, and we, we run these projects and, and, and maybe there's an underlying assumption that they are of some benefit to those local communities. 
It was really interesting. We had um, Ash Sarkar. I don't know if you're familiar with Ash Sarkar from Navarra Media and sort of pundit on TV, but she's local to Peckham and she came in and gave a talk um, a while ago to some of our students as part of one of the units. Um, I mean, she's, yeah, she's pretty kind of um, quick and amazingly sort of incisive, but she did just pose a question to the students and what would it mean if, um, you know, you shared this lecture space with um, a group of homeless people. And there was a sort of stunned silence because I don't think it ever really occurred to the students, it certainly hadn't occurred to the staff, that you would have that level of permeability and, and operate within a community as part of a community, not just as a, as a sort of um, a de facto kind of a, a kind of centre of authority and um, privilege that projected outwards. And I just wondered if you've, if you've been thinking about that or doing something about making the, the walls of the university a bit more permeable and actually sort of, um, you know, whether the co-creation flows the other way into the, the configuration of the university, for instance, you know, at what point did the community start to dictate how the university configured itself? I think that's such a good, such a good question, such a good point. And um, certainly Locksbrook, where you are at the moment, is in um, the area, I'm sure Ian and Jenny have told you, but, you know, it's in the area of the most socio-economic um, deprivation in the city, and there's a 10-year difference between um, the people, the community in, in Twerton, as there is to the life expectancy in Lansdowne, for instance. And I think that um, issues like that, where you can subvert that and say, actually, let's open up our walls, let's make our walls permeable. I mean, interestingly, our other project is called Schools School Without Walls, which is exactly that. It's breaking down the barriers between cultural spaces and um, schools in the city. But I think your point about, you know, permeability and um, trying to, um, so just a, a quick little bit of an anecdote just to show you where I'm coming from. Um, my previous job was at Goldsmiths for seven years and so in terms of the Centre for Arts Learning and opening up those spaces to the community being alongside um, you know the community in New Cross. I think it's really important that it starts with um, the, the consultation with people on the ground wherever you are. So in terms of you know taking a, a more of a kind of anthropological approach that idea that um you know, never doing things to people it's always with and i think that's the benefit of the university being in a city that is um so manageable in terms of space and size um but also what we're trying to do is break down that idea that you know bath is a white middle class city it's absolutely not it's got pockets of deprivation that are heartbreaking um, and certainly equivalent to you know when I was living um, not too far away from Goldsmiths but I think interestingly um, our VC has got an openness to this idea that you know we can do things differently we've, we've had various conversations with London Interdisciplinary School and the new um, School of the Anthropocene in Cambridge University, which is actually the same thing, trying to dissolve those barriers of access and then opening up the potential for widening participation. So I know the announcement around massive English was um, a bit shocking this week, but I think that idea that, you know, the university can be for everyone. And I suppose that's what, one of the things I'm trying to do with the work is to show that seamless reflexive approach where we're talking with Andrew and Kirsten about having a Saturday art club for instance in Locksbrook that that would involve the local community. I know Tash Kidd who is leads on fine art um, she is also working on the idea of having the you know the Bath Art Deco involving um, local, local schools and the local community so it's kind of crushing those um, barriers down and opening up the spaces of possibility. Really. I'm not sure I've answered your question fully, but I'm very interested in this from the another discussion. I'm conscious it's your lunch hour. So what I'll do is I'll pop um, those links to the City of Imagination in the chat. Um, but I'm really happy to follow up um, with another conversation at any time. Um, I said to 
from my group in Barcelona yesterday, we would it would be great if Interstice, our group, which is University of Autonoma Barcelona, University of Bologna in Italy, University of Stavanga in Norway and ours, working alongside our charity as well. So it would be great to bring your group and our um, other Erasmus project together at some point. And we've, we've focused, it's called Intercise because it's the space between artists, educators and, and children, families. But I mean, uh, although a lot of my work is um, for and with children and people, it's, it is very um, transferable in terms of the pedagogical approach. So thanks everyone. <laughs>